balances and it does the thing that this panel was intended to do, where you've got that kind of, we understand that storytelling is important and is part of our kind of collective visioning, it's part of how we understand the myths and the realities of something, it's how we know each other, it's how we know what's out there and what the sense of place is and what's possible here. But also the types of stories that are useful in terms of selling things are quite particular. And it's taken us quite a while to get good at telling those ones and to understand that if you're going to build up an Instagram presence that's going to support your focus store, you need to have certain literacy, certain skills, certain types of aesthetics to be able to play with. But if in moving that effort, have we forgot to tell the other stories? Have we forgotten to tell the stories about the realities of making these places, making, these, making a living around these things? I'm, I'm going to be quite cruel and just say, Emma, what is your instinct on this? Um, well, I don't think anybody's getting rich, let's put it that way. I think I'd be hard pressed to think of anybody in my peer network or people I admire or respect to are uh, living high on the hog, actually, with making and creating whatever that looks like to them. Um, personally, I think, um, well, we were just discussing this actually, you throw yourself into things as much as you care. It's not. It might be lifestyle. It might not be. It might be a better life. It's. it's but at the end of the day, you can't switch off the emotional. Um, not doing it for profit making. Really. So yeah. you are doing a lot of emotional lifting, which may or may not be apparent to the rest of the world. And if you're trying to be strong for other people, then actually there's a point where you need to play the oxygen mask to yourself as well. And I think it's very. I think we are in a better time online because there's a lot more conversations around mental health and well-being and being able to talk about burnout, which I've started talking about a bit more without feeling embarrassed about that. But I think we should all be able to say it's fucking knackering, basically. If you want to say that, obviously, if you don't want to say it, I don't have to. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. And I think you need to keep being able to be open and replenish and, and just know that you actually have to actually hand the baton on to other people as well. That's the other thing. Is you can't do it all yourself, but sometimes you know people are going to let go and say, I've done as much as I can to get it to this point, and other people can step in now and I can be okay with that, and create a massive slush fund and go on holiday for ages. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's <laughs> all do that. I was thinking, because earlier we mentioned the barn raising, and that aspect of either coming together to do a production run or an assembly line, or to make a thing happen. It sounds like some of that intensive forest experience is almost acting as a barn raising, where you're kind of enabling people to do a thing together and learn and have that collective experience that then means as individuals they are better makers, they are better practitioners. In the way. What, what is the role of barn raising? What does a barn raising look like now in this world that lets us make better stories together? About 10 years to gaze is a really useful thing for people who are um, in, a se in a sector or in a, in a community to say, look how far we've come actually, and take some moments of um, you know, joy and celebration of each other's successes, but also do exactly what everybody's been really open and honest about, which is why I actually do love the maker community more than any other self you know, a described community. Because there's such an openness and a generosity and a have you tried this and what about that network in a way that I don't experience in other types of communities. Um, so yeah, I think more of that really, which is saying this is needed, you know, to type of coming together. And valuing that, yeah. saying that yes, some of these conversations are conversations we've had in small groups or in different platforms, but also actually coming together now and having you guys in the room, having this panel in the room, this is a really valuable barn raising in and of itself. Mm -hmm. It builds and it valorizes and it interrogates and questions some of how we do what we do. Mm. I was just saying, like, and people come together for different things, like different, different reasons, don't they? Like, um, <coughs> there's a bunch of meetups that happen through Foxy in real, in real life. Um, and they don't come together necessarily to learn how to be better crafters or to learn how to better at selling their stuff. Actually, a lot of it's just kind of like, I just want to hang out with my people. Yeah. Uh, and actually, that's, that, that's got value. You know, this isn't necessarily all about making money or all about kind of progressing a career. It's sometimes just about feeling like at home. 
yeah. and uh, and comfortable and happy. And that's you know, I think we should recognise that. Absolutely. I think um, I was sort of reading I think this morning about a business awards thing in, in Glasgow, and um, I, I felt quite nauseous about how the press releases from certain companies were massive pats on the back for how well they had done, but they're not afraid to do that. They win an award, so it means that they're recognised by somebody else for having succeeded in that category or whatever. So if they're not afraid to do it, why are we not? Why are we so terrified about actually saying, do you know that bit was good? And I'm, I'm the first to admit, I've, I've done some good stuff, I've done some not great stuff. Um, and now, it's only now, like two years later, I can actually kind of open up about that stuff. But I think we need to, be, to continue positive momentum, then actually it's pretty amazing what's going on. Um, so, yeah, whilst, and we spoke earlier about one of the fr uh, phrases that always sort of slightly turned my stomach as well was a, a social entrepreneur. <laughs> it never sat easy with me. But then that was a, that was a sort of emerging thing as well at that time. Um, so I think there's quite a lot of stuff where we actually kind of need to give yourselves credit for what you're doing. Um, and we are particularly bad at that. Independent makers are particularly bad at actually taking a step back and going, that looks really good. I was talking to someone earlier about what took place at a maker. And we said actually there's a humility and a humbleness that sort of most people don't sort of thrust themselves forward and it's hard to do that, especially if you're alone as well. But I would say that that may be a, a challenge at times if you are working in very small groups or you don't have the support network of like a, an agency or what have you, to have someone to write the PR or to catch it from yourself in your own personal story is to have that spotlight shone upon you and all your practice. It's so what you're doing there and allowing people to sort of refine their storytelling is really important. But I think we also need to be PR agents for each other as well so that we can kind of go, have you seen this? It's awesome. And be like really excited for people. In little incremental sort of gains that we get should be cherished because they're, they're hard won. They might look like they're easy from the outside, but they're not by any stretch of the imagination. So just checking in with people and going, how are you doing? Would be a part of that. Yeah, definitely. And having that collective learning from things that don't work. Yeah, as well. I think that's really important. I think as a random example of that, where it is about shouting other people, if you go out and follow a lot of the makers who have made on Instagram, so to speak, and they have got their millions of followers, and when they name drop new followers, they may name drop other makers, it's like, that has made or break them, and it's, mm -hmm. that's the, I guess the essence of what's kind of captured as a group of people in a city or a, a community. We can't do that as a social media, you can't just go, hashtag so-and-so, or, you know, yeah. you know even if, even if yeah. Yeah, essentially, yeah. we don't have a business card, so, it's kind of well, it's that it's catching the essence of that someone who has a bit of a voice maybe, yeah. and how they can go look at that. I've just noticed he's coming in that world. Look how awesome he is. How do you capture that? And if you're not in part of this environment and you are on your own, you don't know people, and you're out of that kind of circle for whatever reason, for you, how do you capture that essence of being around? I don't know. And I think it's that, you know, um, Adrian was saying this is a little bit of a sort of sideways step point or thing there, but I was like, I'm really interested in that thing. Why not have build a bear for a box? my provocation is like why not have a mass appreciation uh, of people who might actually have never encountered makers making and it's beyond that sort of group of people who kind of already know each other or are you know two degrees of separation it's like what would be the I mean this is my true kind of democratization of this stuff is why shouldn't there be one next to every McDonald's Maybe I asked the question on Twitter about in McDonald's and I said no it's going to in mess, food and making, but the principle of like how comfortable would we be to be, you know, for more people to know about the awesome stuff that's happening? Kickstart is one way of doing it, but what about on the physical built environment on our high streets? How do people feel about that? You know, does it take it from being something quite precious and intimate to something which might feel too too massive? Well, people volunteer for all sorts of things, don't they? So why wouldn't you have a shop somewhere on like, well, High Street? I'm not going to start a conversation with High Street and read certain things, but you could have a shop that was a manufacturing line of volunteers making things. I guess you need the will and the space and time to do it, I guess, but it's, yeah. Alex, a question. I'm wondering about the um, emotional burden uh, that we put on ourselves, I think, above and beyond someone who's running a cafe. 
um, and whether uh, you know on your social entrepreneurship elements, I think that we take on when we grow communities of making communities of engagement, communities where we're actually enabling other people to do things, that we take on more emotional burden than we would otherwise, and that that's quite a maker thing. And um, yeah, hundred percent. I. By name, almost every one of those members that we had as, a, as an organisation um, could tell you what they were doing. I felt every up and down of their journey, I, but then felt so pressured to keep providing for them that I couldn't make decisions which, as a ruthless capitalist, you would just go, yeah, whatever, done. Um, there is a, a, a really enormous emotive sort of element to it. Um, Why? Why is that uniquely maker thing? Because I'm slightly uncomfortable with the idea that there's makers and then there's kind of hipsters and then there's everybody else. And like how? How is that? Actually it's just us who are people and why is that care amplified differently? Why is that burden amplified differently? Supposedly because Well, well three hands, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Because it, it's, it's, you know, going back to the mental health discussion we mentioned earlier on, it, it is like for me getting out of the house and meeting up with makers and meeting up and helping to build a community. Yes, it's, it's not, a significant not part of being a member of the maker space. Yeah. And so it, it, there's that involvement, that commitment that, that is part of being a maker. So part of the self identity, but also part of how you trade and live and coexist in that community. Yeah, is and, you know, how you, more you, you give a little bit of yourself mm -hmm. into the community and to contribute towards it and make it better. And it is a community, you know, yeah. Is it is it possible because the majority of us, whether we're providing a maker space or using it, have come from a making background. So you're quite relatively precious about like I, like I, as an architect, I was incredibly precious about every project I have. Still, I'm still passing and like pick this tune come up. So I still do that, and I'm so precious about all those things. So then, I, as a as a a network provider, if you like, I was then also precious about all the contents of that network. And um, so, is a is it kind of rooted in the fact that we are all quite similar in terms of where we started off from? I question whether it's whether people are that supportive of some, some horrible behaviour and trolling and nastiness. Mm -hmm. I think it can be deeply factional and unpleasant. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just don't want to lie out there. It's not, it's <laughs> not a happy world. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's human beings, isn't it? I mean, that's never going to be easy at the end of the day. People are trying, don't they? Yeah. And I've had, yes, I run the first school we and I'm a teacher, so I've got a foot in both camps. Currently, I'm the only one that I think there's plenty of other makers and teachers around there who are calling me. Um, the pressure is immense, not only from teaching, because we're all crying out to do it, we are not have the time to do it, or the resources to do it, or support to do it, you know? but obviously, because the expectation and the pressure that you have, because you want to do the making justice is phenomenal and you know quite often I'm, I get asked for a lot of projects and to do a lot of things and, and it's only probably maybe the last year that I've started to really turn some down because there's still only one of them, you know I've got a team of a few people and maybe there'll be a team of other teachers but even that you know the, the ones who are educators that I can name I can probably name on maybe two bands across the country and a lot of them have moved into the industry because it was better more, more profitable and we don't get to have constraints. But the, the pressure that we put on ourselves as makers, if it comes from a sense of pride that I'll be a part of the community and we want to do that community just as we want to represent it, as it is, you know, a really thriving, supportive community that we all love. And I think because of that, and we take it on, we take it on, we take it on, and then struggle to cope with it. And um, yeah, I think I've felt that before now with the um, with the variety of people make that's been a perfect example. And I think also we've said we don't always get 
the mass of people, of the variety of people, sometimes you get leaders who can really laugh at the pit and you have to think. And yet, I think we take that more to heart in our community because you expect them to have that ethos. And then we see that they don't, you know, deeply disappointed. So I think, um, I think as a teacher and a maker, as a teacher, we don't take we really used to criticism all the time, we don't take this person who doesn't make criticism. So it's a bit of a conflict between the two most of the time. I think that's really interesting actually because I don't consider myself a maker. I make slime and that's about it at the moment. But the, the thing I reflect on is um, how you can't fix people's problems. Okay. So if you're for facilitative or coaching kind of methodology, you know you've got not to fix all the things. And I don't know, because I'm not a maker, whether or not this is gross generalisation, but people who like to solve problems are good makers, I think, and good fixers of problems. And so do you, does that sort of mindset also mean that you've got to fix other people's problems if they present them to you? I don't know, just a question, but if you're able to kind of go, that isn't actually my problem, and my job is to help you work your own solution out to that, do you create a different dynamic in all of that? But you do, I mean, my own experience is that you will experience the most amount of curious people when you do a thing in a space. And it won't always be, um, how can I put it? So you, you will attract the people who might not consider themselves normally um, mainstream, let's say. And so you, you're constantly having a really mixed group of people sort of vibing off each other. And so there's something around that as well of like different, what do you call it, like neurodiversity. And there's a the whole range of different needs and wants and if you have got volunteers they've all got particular reasons for being in that space as well and it does become quite a contested space if if not carefully facilitated I think would be the can, I, can I make a point which is um, just uh, I think I'm not sure about um, I th so I feel that a bit more honesty about the economy of making help um, because I feel that um, we see possibly because pe some of the good storytellers, some, the people who do well are good storytellers, and we see people who who, su who are successful, and I believe that you can be successful. Um, and I think there's a, some honesty about that being a, the real exception um, would be useful to stop, the, to maybe to prevent the kind of that anxiety, the mental health issues that go along with perhaps living a portfolio career and, and having a very precarious existence. Yeah. I think that's that. For me, would be very useful. We tell that to people on folks. It's kind of going, look, great if you want to. If this is just a, a pocket money thing, brilliant. Yeah, this is fine. If you want to do the day job, then that that journey is a long one, and you've got to work really super hard, and it's not easy, it's, and you may not succeed. <coughs> um, and I think that's that's just a healthy conversation to have. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I just wanted to say, in the context of the people who are focusing as I would see it, so if I sit on the kind of craft and maker and community kind of right. barrier, I'm quite interested if you see a difference between the maker communities that exist around maker spaces, where it's very much um, almost a physical community, as opposed to the loans and craft and making a home that has an online support network. Because you mentioned you don't necessarily see it as a support in the space, I wonder if that's a difference between. Yeah, it probably is. And I uh, um, so I had something to do with the, the main space in Stoke, we set up a few years ago, so I know a little bit about the different communities and I know that we tried, I tried really, I'm not a, uh, I, I'm not really a maker, I feel like you can possibly have, but um, uh, I have a, a real interest in um, the stuff that uh, Adrian and Alex are doing and you know, the, the you know, museum of box and all the kinds of things, it's super exciting. And we, we tried really hard in the early days of Foxy to, to work with those communities, to pull them in and get them you know, to make it a more diverse kind of uh, platform, failed miserably. Um, it is still uh, predominantly um, uh, soft craft um, and hobbyists, and uh, even within that, quite you know, a particular segment of them. Um, and I feel that we fail because uh, they are different communities, um, and I've not seen, I've not seen them coexist. You have. I'm not a big interest to see if people have seen them quite exist. Well, we tried something um, around the Make Fair in Newcastle years ago where we tried to bring those communities together to make something. Um, we've got so people who are into soft crafts and making with those who are into um, uh, kind of software engineering and hardware. 
and it, it, it was super difficult. It was they got on really well, but it was just such a small bunch of people we we in money to get together, um, and it just didn't flourish. I'd say we've got a lot of people here who use the laser cutters for making things, and then mm -hmm. some might seeing stuff, you know. Yeah. But so I wouldn't say there's that entirely separate thing. It's, I'm not saying it's entirely separate, yeah. but I do believe they're they're distinct. And that's probably not unmanaged as well. There's been a lot of strategy, I think, about how you. Yeah, but yeah, it does look, yeah. I think Liverpool Makefest does actually create a broader um, kind of range of like soft crafts and tech stuff as an experience, more than I ever experienced at uh, Makefest at uh, Make Fair at Newcastle. It seems to do a much more intentional, curated job of doing that, or more open invitation, or mm. so it didn't feel like um, it was all tech, which Make in Newcastle did feel. I would say that's probably because the three founders of this are educated. So, and, and obviously, it does as a major part of the company, and we kind of had things. But we wanted something that would show a range of making for kids. It wasn't for necessarily making or necessarily technology people or necessarily crap. We just wanted kids to be able to experience the cool things that were going on. Yeah. And especially in a place that was. Not owned by anybody, so it was a community space that we could go to that was one time, which is you know, why it's flourished now, it's not just many, many more places. But I think it was because we wanted to take things that were already good and be able to have uh, kids come and see them. And then that's why I think we've always come around with curating it so it's very, very broad range. And we wanted to be able to use making, producing, or even what's the problem like the shape. Lots of people from the very interesting world. Yeah. Um, so it does give it quite a range. And I felt like making fur itself, we didn't go down because we pulled an arm up and we didn't make fur. Um, it was much more restricted. Yeah. And, and it was very down on sort of in a very techie route. But I didn't think it was necessarily accessible to you know, like a kid who wants to. I think it definitely did rattle dazzle. Like you take kids there and it's like, what? And then they come out and it's like they've just gone, what just happened to me? Whereas Liverpool was definitely like, oh, they make a wand and they made a wand and then they got comfortable and then they went and did something else. And it's those little, how do you just make this comfortable experiences in a library? Yeah. You know, so there were so many things that actually I just thought the curation and the intent was everything. And, yeah. and it's somewhere yeah. between kind of storytelling as spectacle and storytelling as. Relatable yeah. thing. Cat. Yeah. I was going to say, I find it really, like I'm from Vancouver originally, and I used to come from the Vancouver Mini Maker Fair, it's still me. Um, and I've also been to the Maker Fair in Singapore, and, and what you're saying really made me think about how these, these events are really both being derived, but they still have this top down approach to them, as we all know. And I think it's really interesting how these events legitimize who feels like a maker in that city. So like in Singapore, it was university students who were already in like polytechnic universities, and they were the only ones I ever saw calling themselves makers, self-identifying in that way. And Vancouver is very feminine oriented, so I saw like kids at the Vancouver Public Library who were like, in a maker community of their own. And so I guess so I've not been to Liverpool before, so this is my first time here. So I was wondering like, um, are there ways that events here that are created here make it? Uh, both easy but also difficult for some people to identify as makers. You know, like where, where are you guys doing well at, at engaging a lot of people and where, where could you be better? Also that question uh, that we've kind of edged around and we're all kind of very aware that maker is a branded term with probably literally a patent attached to it or a copyright. The commercialization of... Wait, wait, where is that? Sorry. What did you say makers are branded to? I was getting there, Smithy. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, because we've kind of the maker movement launched in a very public facing way with Make Magazine in the US and that kind of very dominant rhetoric around makers being associated with the kind of new craftspersonship coming from the kind of hobbyist and popular mechanics route. That's the kind of visible front that people kind of see as makers and identify with or identify against. So we've not said that 
but is that some of the things we're kind of tiptoeing around in our attempt at authentic storytelling? Is this big expectation? There's an analogy, sorry, there's an analogy that mirrors that with CrossFit. Do you know what CrossFit is? Mm-hmm. And that, like, there's the exact same analogy of that. There's a branded nature of CrossFit gyms. You can do CrossFit, but you, don't, you, have, to, you, you have to buy the name to do it in the franchise. It's the same thing that, that's a good thing and a bad thing, and a terrible thing, depending on who you speak to. And it is, no, it's in the brand. Yeah. It's, it's a weird, weird mix of like, sellotape is the brand, not the thing. And yeah. like, yeah. like, yeah. like, yeah. like, yeah. that's the same narrative here, is that like, yeah. yeah. so make, yeah. yeah. yes, we're in a space, we're in a space, we're making things. So, yeah, it's, it's that same interesting thing for me. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, I suppose just I want to pick up on Emma's like having my egg at McDonald's. I think we totally should. <laughs> um, and you know, I think we're heading there, but I also think we need to head there at the right rate because what we're doing is culture change for like the entire country. It's not about just giving everybody a 3D printer and a laser cutter. Yeah. Because um, that will just replicate. That and that's just slightly like, bauble, isn't it? Really? But, yeah, yeah, but you need to do the community stuff. So you can't, you can't like turbocharge it because you'll just get the default culture mapped onto the 3D printers. I get it. Whereas we're like, yeah, it's growing slightly more slowly, and but we should totally be aiming to get there. I'll be with you on that side of things. But I mean, Jim and Mike, that's all. You know, when we did four years ago, have a 3D printer and shipping container, it was like catnip for people who've never seen a 3D printer. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's like, what, what actually turns people on is something they've not seen before. If that is your way of getting someone over the threshold, use that. But don't make that the thing that actually people are going to learn quite exclusively. Sending out the things that took three hours at a go would have been like You close on this? Just, just a, the way I like to think of it, and probably miles off the mark, is I would like in the future for maker spaces or fab labs or whatever you want to call them to be like gym culture. In the, in the 1900s, people who went to gyms were really weird. You know, there weren't a lot of them. And people who exercise for any other reason than to do physical labour were odd, you know? Uh, and then if you work through the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, people go to the gyms and they'd be like Mr. Universe or Miss Universe or whatever, and it's still pretty weird, but it's becoming more and more mainstream until it's the 80s. And now it's quite normal to have a gym membership and not be some fringe weirdo, <laughs> for want of a better expression. And, it would be great if make spaces could be that normalised that you just go, well, I'm going to just go and make a thing down the McDonald's. <laughs> and, and that was just like how I, that's my kind of dream for the future is that maybe it'll be that normal just to go and make a thing somewhere. Yeah, I think that's a perfect image. Five minutes comfort break, and then I will bring it to the next one.